I hope all y'all are at least getting something out of this. Is it's just this is the truth that has set me free. And when I when I preach, teach, whatever you want to call it, I just pour my heart out, you know. And I and I, I just I just give what I've learned um, because I want everybody to be free. And I, I suffered so much, and I don't anymore. And it's just I I gotta thank you. I love you too. I gotta t- I gotta tell people that truth that set me free, you know. So quickly going back to life teams. What the pastor's bringing forward. We go out together because it's, it's, not, it's not just about this. It's about getting one, to know one another. And I pour myself into the people that we meet with. And that's what we're trying to do. So that's why a life team setting um, is really good to, to do with, in, in conjunction with church. Okay? So now we're going to get back into this. So we read 1 John 2.20, 1 John 2.27. So we're going to go to Galatians 3, starting in verse 22, which is on page 138. These are new manuals they printed. We don't even have these in Canada yet, so I'm not familiar with the page layout. But So verse 22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under a law, shut up uh, in the faith, or unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. See, the law was a shadow of things to come. Right? So everything in the Old Testament was a, was a foreshadowing to Christ. So it was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. What's this mean? We're no longer under the law. Technically, Gentiles were never under the law. Jewish people were, not Gentiles. Right? So we were never really under the, the law unless you're Jewish. Um, but for uh, under schoolmaster, verse 26. But for you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Okay, you've put him on. There is neither Greek, no Jew, Jew nor Greek, bond or free. There is neither male nor female. What does this mean? Women can preach. Women can teach. People, say, people have a hang-up on that. Oh, women preachers, who should not be women preachers? Did you tell Jesus that? Who was Jesus' first evangelist? The woman at the well. Think about that. She went back in and said, hey, you want to meet this man that told me everything I did? And then Mary Magdalene, I mean, all that stuff. They ran. Who were the first people? They went back and started proclaiming the risen Christ. Women. Oh, women have no place in ministry. Oh, give me a break. Neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, the word child again means immature Christian. So as long as that heir, as long as he is an immature Christian, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So what does that mean? If you're an immature Christian, you are Lord of all, but you differ nothing than a, from a servant because you don't know that you're Lord of all. This is why we have to raise up the body of Christ to understand who they are so they can exercise that lordship, if you will. Okay, we're not lords over anybody, but I'm talking about dominion on the earth. Like Curry laid it out, job, got man's original position, man's original job was to have dominion on the earth. And people think it's weird that we have, we say we, need, we have dominion over the earth. That was what God said. He said, let us create man in our own image. Right? You realize that God had... I might trip you up here. This might, this might be what sends you out the door early. Do you, do you realize that God has a body? See, some people think he's just a, a floaty around you. But what did he say? Let us create man in our own image. It talks about God walking in the garden. It talks about the finger of God, the hand of God. It says, my eyes are upon you. It says, all this stuff. God has a body. You know, God has a soul. Did you know that? God has emotions. Of course he does. The Bible says that, that it, um, you know, it stuns a prediction. My, my soul has no delight in them. I take, it talks about it several times that God has in his soul. He has a soul. And he is... He is a spirit. He's not spirit. He is a spirit. 
Because if he's just spirit, then he says, well, everything's just spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's a spirit. And he has a body. And he has a soul. That's why we're created a three-part being. Because he's a three-part being. And he's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Read it out. It'll amaze you. You've got to study it out. This is why it's important to study the Bible. So you, you see this stuff. Instead of God just floating around everywhere. Now, is he? Absolutely. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. All the time. Everywhere. You, even the psalmist said, if I go to the depths, you're there. If I go to the heavens, you're there. I can't get away from you. Then why are we in church? Apparently, God's not in church because we're always begging for his presence. Is that right? God, send your presence. Send your presence. God, which, which, could somebody come up here and create the atmosphere? I know Curry was talking about this yesterday, but that's what we do. We've got to get, create this atmosphere God, for God to be able to work. And, that's, and if he's not here, then I guess we're all done. But apparently, he's in the depths, according to David. And apparently, he's in the heavens. Where can I go, he said, to escape your presence? I can't. But again, apparently, it's church. Because this is the only place that he might not be. Which isn't true. But you know what I'm saying, right? I'm, I'm obviously being a bit silly. But it's true, though. If he's here, if he's everywhere, then why isn't he here? Why can't we thank him for his presence is already here instead of begging him to get him to come? Because we serve emotion. And then we get the goosebumpies and the hair stands on end. Can that stuff be real? Of course it can be real. I've experienced it myself. But if you serve that, you could become a Samson. Become a, just like him when he said, I'll go shake myself. And he didn't know that God had left him. So I used to preach one saved, always saved. Like I said before, no way. There's too much stuff in, in Scripture um, that talks against it. it. talks about becoming a son of perdition and all this other kind of stuff that my soul doesn't take delight in him. I used to be a huge teacher, preacher, whatever, of one saved, always saved. If you said the prayer, you're golden. That is not true. The Bible talks about faith waxing cold and the love of cold and all that other kind of stuff, which means, yeah, but God says he will never leave me nor forsake me. You're 100% correct, but it does not say that you can't leave nor forsake him. Well, it says that, that nothing will separate me from the love of God. You're 100% right. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. But your lack of love will separate you from God. Your lack of living righteously will separate you from God. Absolutely. If that's not the case, then how can you be separated from your spouse? What separates spouses? A lack of love. Right? Have you ever met anybody who got divorced and they're madly in love with each other? No. If they're madly in love with each other, they're together. They're, they're respecting. They're honoring one another. Honor is something that we need to learn. You know, in Christianity, towards one another, especially in marriage. I honor my wife and everything that she does, everything that I do, I honor her. That's why I always introduce her. She's the most important person to me in the world except for Christ. And she knows it. She's a second place to nobody but Jesus Christ himself. And I told her, you better feel the same way about him. I'm not first place. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> I know, I, I get it. You know. but, but he better be first in your life in all things. I don't mind taking a second best seat to Christ. That's, that's all good with me. Anyway. So, Lord, be the Lord of all. But under his tutors and governments until the appointed time of the Father, even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Adoption. We've been adopted. It's amazing. So here's another thing. Talking about the legal right. You know, going back to the courts of heaven thing, that the devil has a legal right to you. I hate this teaching. That's why I kind of beat on it. I don't know how prevalent it is here, but in Canada, it's hugely prevalent. And I go there and I beat that thing into the ground. Okay? Now this says that you've been adopted um, as sons, that you might receive the adoption of sons. What? Sons of God, right? If you adopt somebody... My parents adopted my youngest, well, she was my niece, and then my parents adopted her, so she's really, she calls me her, her bruncle. I'm her brother-uncle, okay? So I, I, by nature, I am her uncle, but by adoption, I became her brother. So again, that's why I'm her bruncle. So, but my sister, my oldest sister, there were some things going on in her life that I had to give up 
Jenny, my younger sister, when she was two years old. So my parents, I drove down, picked her up with my friend, came back, and we, we took her, and my sister couldn't raise her and all that stuff. Eh, I hope my sister's not watching, but she married some doozies. Well, she, would, she wouldn't care if I said that, but she, she married some, some guys, I'll tell you. But anyway, so we took my sister, and my parents adopted her when she was either seven or nine years old, can't remember. She's 32 now. Adopted her. So now my sister, my, my biological sister, has no legal right to her. Why? Because she was adopted by my parents. So she has no legal right. So I've been adopted into the kingdom of God. Therefore, the devil has no legal right. Why? Because it's been signed, sealed, and delivered. And I am saved, I am whole, and I belong to him. Therefore, the devil has no legal right to me. So I don't know how they get off on this and teach this stuff. But Verse 6, and because you are sons, so you see that, that we redeemed them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. So we're still talking about the anointing. And because you are sons, God has set forth his spirit of his son in your hearts, crying out, Father, what came first, the position or the spirit? The position. And because you are sons, you're anointed. And then the spirit of the Lord comes upon. Nowhere in scripture do we see anybody moving in power, like Curry talked yesterday, without the spirit of the Lord being upon them. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, like he said, it doesn't say by the anointing, Abraham did this, or by the anointing, this person did this. By the anointing, this person did this. It says by faith, by faith, by faith, right? Same thing here, that you've been adopted into the family of God. That now, because you're appointed, you're anointed into a position, now the Spirit of God can come upon you. Now you can move in power, Acts 1.8 says. But after you've been moved into a position... So that, again, to hammer it home, the anointing has nothing to do with power. There is no scripture that says the anointing, when the, when the anointing moves, you'll have power. So we, like I said on Sunday, we've been, we've been in, who was here on Sunday, by the way? Was there, there a few people? Okay. So we've been in church services where they say, okay, you know, the pastor is bringing an anointed word, and the children's worker is, you're going to bring an anointed word to the children, and the worship leader is going to be anointed, and this is anointed, and this is anointed, and apparently God's got all these buckets of anointing, and he's running around, oh, they need this, and they do that, and over here, and they need this. It's not that. And they start chasing something. And you try to talk to them about it, you're just wasting breath. So because your sons, God sent forth a spirit into your hearts, crying out, but Father, wherefore there, you are no more a servant, but a son. We're no more servants, but a son. And, and, and your daughters, I get it, but you're a son because you're in him. So he sees you as he sees his son. And if a son, then an heir through Christ, of God through Christ. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service to them by nature, which are by nature no gods. But now, after you've known God, or rather are known of God, God knows your name. God knows who you are. But I felt for so long God had no idea who I was because of what I did, because I didn't have the anointing, because I, I mean, and all that stuff of God. God couldn't know who I am. But Scripture says that you have known God, or rather are known of God. That's good. God knows who I am. That should just do something to you. How turn ye again to the beggarly, weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire to be again in bondage? Okay, You see that. So why you're known of God and you know God, how are you now turning again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire to be again in bondage? Okay, There's a reason I hit that. Verse 10. You observe days and months and times and years. Think about that. Well, we got to jump on this fast. We got to jump on this fast. Like I said earlier on. Well, we got to observe this day. We got to do this and we got to do this. And it becomes about rituals. These are rituals. And the Bible calls them bondage. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't fast, like I said earlier on, or you, you know, if you have a Sabbath, I mean, that's all good. But if it's a law to you, then you might as well keep all the law. Because the Bible says if you break one law, you broke them all. There were 630 Mosaic laws. What? You know, some, like I t said earlier on, there's some religions that have three million gods. How on earth? You're bound to make one of them mad. You know? So you observe times and months 
or days and months and times and years, I'm afraid of you. That doesn't mean I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid for you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So Paul said, listen, you believe in Christ. You've been adopted. You've done all this stuff. You're in the, you're in the kingdom of God. You've been, you've been anointed. The Spirit of the Lord, all this stuff is happening. And now you want to go back under the law? Now you want to start observing days and months and times and years and all that kind of stuff? Those are the beggarly elements of the world. Why? Because he is your rest. He's made you free. Amen. And you live free. It's so, it's, oh, it's so, good. There's so much we could talk about. So we're going to try to get through this a little bit here. Uh, section 16, page 141. Psalm 32 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which you shall go. I will guide you with mine eye. And the Bible talks about having a, uh, a single eye, a single mind. So God's going to direct you with it. He's going to guide you with that thing. But keep your mind focused on him. What does verse 9 say? It says, Be ye not as the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a brit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. So what's to say? Most Christians want to be you know, led second by second. And it sounds good. It's just not biblical. What this is saying is, hey, listen, if you have to be led around second by second, you're like a horse or a mule who has no understanding. That's what the Bible says. The funny thing is, I teach this all the time. Jesus wasn't always nice, but he was always kind. See, we want to create this nice Jesus, and Christians just have to be nice. Well, what does that mean? Nice just basically means you're a doormat, or you know, you're, just, you're basically sugarcoating everything. Jesus never sugarcoated anything. What did he tell the religious leaders? You're a bunch of whitewashed graves. You're, you're, you're nice and white and clean on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Is that what he said? That's what he said. And what did he say? You can't be my disciples if you do this and this and that. Your father's the devil. You make your disciples the, twice the child of hell as you are. You brood of vipers. And then if we say something wrong in church, oh boy, the pastor's getting a Facebook post. For real. Isn't that what happens? My pastor didn't make me feel good today. You, I'm, I'm not saying this about anybody, but back in the day, don't anybody take offense on this. I'm just saying something the way they used to preach. They would stand up there, and I mean, they would get after it, and they would say stuff. And, and, and even Dr. Summerall, he'd say, are you here? He said, if you believe that, you're all just stupid. I'm not advocating for that. But I am saying they had something, a grit, a determination. They had a truth of the word of God. They had conviction in them and people weren't so offended. Now, I'm not saying that we should go around calling people stupid. I'm not saying that. There were certain words they used 50 years ago that they don't, we don't use now. I get that. But this whole thing of being politically correct, your political correctness can't go against scripture. Your political correctness can't go against who God is at all. You got to stand and preach the truth in love. And sometimes preaching the truth in love will hurt people. And we never set out to hurt people. But if they get offended by the truth of the word of God, that's not your fault. As long as you're not hurting them yourself. And this stuff, the truth of the word of God can hurt people, but only if you're not living for it. But, the, but what this book says shouldn't hurt you. Because it's who you are. Every word in this book is about love, believe it or not. And it shouldn't hurt you. But again, we want feel, feel good stuff, you know. The result of having the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 11. But if, the word if happens in the Bible 1,522 times. It's a conditional word. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken, make alive your mortal bodies, by his spirit that dwells in you. This is how mature Christians can get healed. Because the spirit of God, that, that same resurrection power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. It will quicken, make alive, make whole, deliver you 
your mortal bodies. This is whoever had the question about releasing the spirit into your flesh or whatever. This is what that is. Learning that, that thing that raised Jesus, that power that raised Jesus from the dead, it dwells in you and it will make alive and quicken your mortal body. You just have to learn how to, to, to release that. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So if you look at that, the original Greek text says, for as many as are being constantly led by, the, by God's Spirit, they're the sons of God. See, the thing is that we're constantly led by the Spirit of God. We're, we're led by His nature. We're led by His desires. We're led by um, who He is, His character, all that stuff. We're led by that because He's put a new nature in you. The problem is that nature, again, was put into you as a seed. So now we're going to go over quickly to, um, where were we? Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Now this is Jesus speaking. Again, we're talking about the, the being led by the Spirit, the anointing, all that stuff, okay? Luke 4, verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He's, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering sight of the, uh, to the blind, to set them at liberty or freedom to them that are bruised. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. So what came first? Position. The position. As what? God's Son. And then, at 30 years of age, He got what? The Spirit. Right? When He got baptized, the Spirit descended on Him as a dove. So even for Jesus, the anointing came first. The position as God's Son came first. And then the power came upon Him. And that's when He began His ministry was after receiving the Holy Spirit. So, so many people in the Christian world has, have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what brings power. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you. They have no idea what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Okay? Now, you can see people healed and set free and all that kind of stuff without the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the disciples did that before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They went out with authority. But to see it in the fullness, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You absolutely need it. You can do it by authority, but now you have authority mixed with ability, and you have dominion. You have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit for you. You get God's Spirit living in you. That's for you. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for other people, to set people free. That's what it's all about. It's not just about, you know, again, rolling around, getting caught up in the Spirit and all that other kind of stuff. It's about helping people. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And then it says, and then you'll be my witnesses. So being a proper witness requires the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus was a witness to God's goodness, and he went around healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. So our job is to go out healing all over oppressed of the devil because God is with us and you can't do that necessarily without the Holy Spirit. Because that's when you, the word you shall receive power, the word power is dunamis and it means miraculous ability. You shall receive miraculous ability when that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Hallelujah. That's good stuff. And then that's when you walk out and start seeing miracles and signs and wonders in your life. But most people don't teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Most people think that tongues have passed away and all this other kind of stuff and that's simply not true. John Lake said that speaking in tongues was the making of his ministry. John Lake used to speak in tongues and then he would get the interpretation of it. Most of his sermons, most of the books you read and things, if they haven't been edited, which most of them have been, Curry has all the unedited, unedited sermons that were given to him. Most everything you will read has been edited by certain people. So they've been watered down and taken out stuff. Curry has the unedited ones. Okay? They're a lot more potent than the ones you read in the books. Okay, But most of that stuff, if not pretty much all of it, was written out of speaking in tongues. 
And I didn't know that until a few years ago, Curry was talking and he would say, if, you know, if he's driving down the road and he can't write everything down or doesn't have a voice dictator with him or anything, that he would speak in tongues and he would remember it and say, God, seal this in me. And then he'd go to a hotel and then he would start writing it out and he would interpret his own tongues. Pretty cool. And that's exactly what John Lake did. It's pretty amazing, right? So that happened to me a while back. I won't read, I won't read it to you, but... I was, I was actually laying on my bed and I was praying and I was going after it pretty hard and praying in tongues. Really, you know, if you, if you do pray in tongues, you can pray, you know, there's, I don't have time to get into it, but you can pray maintenance tongues, you can pray, you can sing and, and worship in tongues, you can do all that, but you can also do warfare. And I was getting after it. And then God said, now go get a pen and a piece of paper. Okay. So I ran into my office, got a pen and a piece of paper and I wrote down a prophecy that came right at the end of 2018. And it was, it was December 12th of 2018. And it was for, it was a warning for 2019. That warning is now, that it was 2019 that God gave everybody some time to do what they need to do. And I put it all out there. In 2020, now in 2020, that is starting to come to pass. And basically what it was, was that God was going to call into account the people, the false, the false teachers the people serving themselves for money, the people teaching a false gospel. And he was going to separate, you know, he didn't say this, but I'm, I'm saying in my terms, basically the men from the boys sort of thing, the ones who are real and the ones who aren't real. And God is going to hold into account the people that are, that are putting people in, into bondage. And he said, I'm calling you back. I'm calling you back to the real gospel because my gospel isn't weak and it isn't lame and it isn't powerless. I'm calling you back. And it was, it was a warning against people who are teaching falsely. And some of that stuff's starting to happen right now. The people are waking up to the truth of the word of God and they're coming against, you know, mainstream Christianity because it's weak and powerless, you know? And, and so I have interpreted my own tongues at one time too, right? I haven't done it often, but I have done it. So you can see all the stuff that you can do because God's trying so hard to get through to, to every one of us. He's trying really hard. Okay, so we're constantly led. Um, for 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit um, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. So be it that we suffer with him that we may be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestations of the sons of God. Curry was talking about yesterday. The world is groaning and waiting um, for the manifestation of the sons of God. See, we're waiting for a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And God's in the world is waiting for a manifestation of the sons of God. To what? Manifest the Holy Spirit. So if we don't move, God's not moving. It's as simple as that. John 16, 13 on the next page. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever shall hear, uh, that he shall speak, he shall show you things to come. So nothing should really blindside you because the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. God knows everything. So nothing should ever blindside you. I mean, maybe there's some things. Years ago when I was playing football, um, I didn't remember the story until a couple of months ago when I was teaching God because it was way back when. I was actually running along playing football and the play was upfield and I had just finished blocking everything and I felt a bump and I was like, well, that's weird. And I look and this kid's laying on the ground. And I, was like, oh. and I helped him up because he tried to tackle me. He tried to blindside me and he was about this tall <laughs> and he got knocked over. That's the way it should be with the God said, the reason he brought that back up to my remembrance, he said, this is the way it should be with the devil. Even if you're not focused on what's happening over here, if the devil comes and runs into you, he falls over and you say, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> That's what you get. And, right? That's the way it should be. Because you should have this thing built about you. Because you're hidden in Christ, it's like the devil's trying to attack God. Good luck with that. You tried that one time. Guess what happened? You got kicked out. So it says here, He will guide you with all truth. He shall not speak of himself. Whatever he shall hear, that he shall speak. He will show you things to come. The thought in the original Greek text for being filled or led by the Spirit is that of being influenced to the point of action. So, you know, it talks about being filled with anger. Well, that person was filled with anger. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're influenced to the point of action. 
That's what it's talking about. But yet we have in church and different meetings and things where people are saying, come in here, we're going to get you filled with the Holy Spirit and filled. And and we're always having these infillings. Well, where is he going? Do you have a a leaky plug on the bottom of your foot or something that he's just draining out? Where is he going? If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're full of the Holy Spirit. Now act like it. Right? So you're, you're influenced to that point of action. But unfortunately, most people aren't influenced to the point of action. Most people just want us to sit, right? If we want any time on this earth that's going to be good, we need to change some things. You know, we need to stand up and, and preach truth and go into the highways and the byways and, and all that stuff. This is why we're creating those cards I was telling you about to drop off in bars and homes and all this stuff. We're, we're starting some things in Canada where we're going door to door to people's homes, knocking on doors. How can we pray for you? How can we help you? We're not trying to convert people on the front step. We're literally there. How can we help you? You need food? We'll bring you back food. If you need this, we'll bring it back to you. We have teams that go into the malls and lay hands on the sick and just walk through the malls, you know, setting people free. This is, this is how we're trying to, like this one lady said, systematically take a country for Christ. Because we're, we're sending people out in the highways and the byways, and that's, that's what Jesus did. Like Curry, like Curry said, you know, him and God aren't sitting there going, okay, 10, 15, you got an appointment with the woman at the well, then you're going to be over here and doing all. Jesus walked around. He went from city to city setting people free. You can do the same thing, like, like at lunchtime today. The, the gal with the, the wrist brace on her hand. And we're sitting there before, we, I, I didn't even see it because was, I was sitting here and she had a black shirt on so it just looked like part of her sleeve but she was wearing a wrist brace and Pastor Barrett said, what's going on? And she had tendonitis or something like that. So right away Barrett laid hands on her, set her free. It's the way it works, you know? And we had our lunch, went on. It was no, it was no thing, right? It was nothing. That's what we can do but we make it a thing. It's not a thing. Do you need help? Yeah, I do. Be well, be whole. Not going to order my lunch, you know? And it, it can be that simple. I've done it at bank, with bank tellers. I've done it at movie theaters. We went into, my wife and I went to a matinee one time, and this girl was there, and she had this big sling on. I said, what happened? She said, it dislocated my shoulder. And I said, can I pray for you? And she's like, you know what? I said, come around back, because there was a big thing. I couldn't reach her. So we go around back. She comes out. I prayed for her. I said, thank you very much. Went into the movie, came out, and when it came out, she had no sling on. I didn't ask her to take it off. She took it off. It's the way it works. And it always works. But you may say, well, I've prayed for people and I've never seen them healed. Yeah, you've prayed for people, but were you in faith? Because you, you really get what you believe. You know? And we could get into that whole thing, but I'm sure Curry's going to teach on this tonight. So let's finish up here so we can send you away. There's so much to read. It's just, there's just so much, it's just, there's so much information. There is, like Curry says, there, it said, there's no way we can teach this in three days. Yeah, it's good. We'll do it all tomorrow. That's for sure. We'll have a private session in here tomorrow. No. Curry's got to drive up to Broken Arrow, a nine-hour drive, and we jump on an airplane tomorrow sometime in Houston to head home to Canada to teach a new man, and then we're back again with Curry in Texas next week, next week or week after that. So um, where do we want to go? We're going to just a couple of minutes here. We're going to go to Romans 8 on page 140, or yeah, 143. Okay, so there is now no condemnation, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Like I said on Sunday, if you have condemnation in your life, it's either because you're not saved or you're walking after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Because if you're walking after the Spirit, you will not have condemnation in your life. Why? Because your consciousness will be purged, you will have no more remembrance of your sin, and you'll be walking after the Spirit. Okay? Now, People, people say, well, you know, there's uh, verse 1 there, the second part of verse 1 isn't in the uh, old manuscripts. Okay, I agree, it's not in some of the old manuscripts, but in some of them it is in the old manuscripts. But verse 4 is in all the old manuscripts and all translations of the Bible. So once I pointed that out to him, he had nothing else to say. So, verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If you could just get that in you, you're golden. Verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk after the flesh, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Same thing as verse 1. Okay? Now, Verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So if you're not walking in life and peace, are you spiritually minded or carnally minded? According to Scripture, you're carnally minded. That's what it says, right? 
Yeah, look, it's the same thing up there. Imagine that. Carnally minded. Like I said, you can be at peace with God in your spirit and war in, at war with God in your flesh because your carnal mind cannot understand the things of God, even though your spirit's in perfect unit, unity and unison with God. Because the carnal mind is at enmity or war against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But aren't we all God's children? No, nope. we're not. So people say, I oh, don't worry, you're all God's children, everything doesn't matter. You're not. No, the Bible says, if you do not have the Spirit of God in you, you, are, you don't belong to Him. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you do not belong to God. You're created in His image, but you do not belong to Him. So we're not all God's children in that sense. We're all created in the image, like I said, but we don't belong to God. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you are none of His, the Bible says. Read, look it up. If you do not have the Spirit of God, you are none of His. Why? Because you haven't been adopted. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why? Because what's the only way to please God? Faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For you are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, so that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have the Spirit of Christ, he is... Oh, there it says right there. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Pretty plain. And if, that's one of the 1,522 times, Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. So it goes on to talk about all that. You know, this is how we can live in divine health. This is how Curry has learned to live. I traveled with the man all over the place. Never seen him. Weak or broke down. You know? Then it goes on to talk about all that other stuff. Um, so, last thing, we're going to end here. Where are we going to go? Um, verse 26 on page 44, 144. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That's what praying in the Holy Ghost does. You see what it says? It helps our infirmities, our weaknesses. For when we know not what we should pray for, for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. It's talking about praying in the Holy Ghost. And he that searches, all, searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for all the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good that, that love God, to them that are called according to his purposes. So right there, people take that and they say, well, how come we got no you know, car accident happened, I lost all my family? Well, we know God works all things to get together for the good that love him, or for them that love him, Right? How come this happened? How come this tragedy happened? Well, you know, God works all things together for those who love him. That's not true. What, what is it talking about in context? The Spirit praying God's perfect will for you, making intercession for you, God's working all those things for your good. Now, can God take bad things and make them good? Absolutely. But he didn't create the bad things just to make them good. But people take this verse 28 and they mess it up and because they're weak and powerless and they say this is why this is what's happening. God's taking all these things and making them good. God's not doing that. And it goes on to say in verse 29, For whom did he foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called and to whom he called, he also justified or made innocent. The word justified actually means made innocent. And whom he justified or made innocent, them he also glorified. For what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And what this means is, if God is for you, who can be successfully against you? Nobody. Now, there can be people against you, absolutely. But nobody can be successfully against you because you have, you have God on your side. You know, last story. When I was young, I used to be a bit of a brat at times. And uh, I had, we're sitting outside a fence one time with my, with my friend. I was about, I don't know, nine, ten years old. 
and there was a whole group of teenagers, and we would bug, they were far off, and we would bug them. And I would say, you know, you're, you're this and you're that or whatever. And this whole group of guys would start coming towards. We were outnumbered. We were out ganged. We were going to get, you know, the beat down. We were getting all that. But we knew who he had in the house. And that was my sister's boyfriend. He was a tough cookie. So we had this false hope, I guess. Because if he wasn't there, we were, we were finished. But we had a weapon in the house. So when we do that, we'd get closer and closer and closer. And then one of us would go in the house and they'd say, Albert, these, these, these kids are going to beat us up. And then here would come Albert. Jeans, cowboy boots, no shirt on. And he'd come running down that sidewalk and he'd come out that back door and they would scatter. And that's how, it's a, it's a weird way, but that's how I look at, at Jesus. He's my big brother that will defend me. Even if I get myself into a situation, even if I'm wrong, he will still defend me. And if you don't like my big brother... Wait till you meet my father. That's how I liken it. And that's how I remember. Because he will back me up in all things. Even if I mess up. He'll back me up. And I have the whole way to heaven backing me up. So I should be afraid of nothing. I used to be afraid of so many things. Now I don't have any fear. things Things don't bother me. Because I realize who I am in Christ. And I have this big brother who will defend me. And I have a father who will defend me. And I do my best to keep my life hidden in Christ so I'm not blindsided by anything. Like Curry said yesterday, we have a, he is a very good, we have a very good life. We have, I mean, we're not rich by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not talking we have a very good life because we have a million dollars. I'm not talking about that. We have a very good life because we live in Christ. We don't, we don't have ups and downs. My wife and I married 30 years. We never fight. We never argue, never fight, Nothing. I'm not saying there's not opportunity for that. I mean, everybody gets frustrated or whatever the case may be, but we choose not to. So if she's frustrated, then I usually do something stupid to make her laugh or something of that nature. But we never, we never fight. If, if there's any tension whatsoever, we just stop it, walk away. But there, there, there rarely, rarely, rarely ever is because there's no honor in fighting. And if you usually, like Curry said, if you get into a fight, you keep going because you don't ever want to be wrong so we choose not to do that we choose not to fight because we honor one another and I have God that's going to honor me and I honor God so this whole thing I mean Curry's going to be back tonight this this whole thing this, this DHT it's for divine healing but what does divine healing look like to you? If you're, not phys- if you're not physically ill, but you could be emotionally ill, if you could be, you know, whatever it is, whatever it looks like, whatever, whatever you're not whole in, Jesus died to make you whole in that area. Every bit of it. Spirit, soul, and body. And these are the things that I learned to walk in. Because religion never taught me that. Religion taught me depression and guilt and shame, all that stuff that we talked about. But now I'm free. And I'm, and I'm becoming more free. Because I had to really become free of myself. See, we have to be, we have to be free from ourselves and we have to be free from other, our, other people's opinions. Right? So many people base their lives on other people's opinions. Blast something up on Facebook. And somebody... If you, I don't know, you get a new outfit or something, you take a picture and put it on Facebook, and then somebody says something to you. You base your opinion off their opinion, yet you never even met them. You base your day, your self esteem, off a perfect stranger who you've never met that's just what we call a keyboard cowboy. You know, just, just internet trolls going through and making fun of everybody or doing whatever they do because they're trying to get to you. The devil's trying to get to you and break down your self esteem, and you're living by somebody's opinion who might even be some sort of a troll that doesn't even matter and you put your happiness over the computer in a stranger's mind. Amen. Makes no sense to me. I'm going to base I'm going to base how I run my life off somebody else's opinion. I base myself and how I live my life off one person's opinion and that's God. Amen. What do you think of me? Cuz what everybody else thinks don't matter as long as he says I'm happy, keep going. I'm good. And I'm just doing the best I can to make him happy. And it's, really, it's not hard. 
But you know, you know what I mean by that, right? I'm just trying to do, do right by God, by doing right to people. So that's my time for today, guys. God bless you. Um, I hope you got something out of it. it. If you, thank you. If you can get this truth in you, it will change, it will change your life. I promise you it will change your life because it changed my life. But if I had just sat there and read some words on a page like I had always done, the last little tidbit I'll leave you with is this. Don't read this book from a position of trying to get. Read this book from a position of already having because it will change your perspective from you know, being a beggar, trying to beg, beg to get it in you to one that's possessing and having it in you because there's a, there's a possessing Christian and there's a pro, uh, professing Christian. Most people are just professing they have Christ, but they're not actually possessing Christ, right? So that's what I learned how to do is, is possess these words in my heart, and that's what changed my life because I put them into effect. So God bless you guys. We'll, I'm, we'll see you tonight. Yep. Hey, man, give him a hand. Yeah.